Good morning, class. This is Ryan Wasser. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion on Nietzsche's On the Genealogy of Morals. Today, we're going to be discussing Essay 2. Uh, a couple of quick notes, again, just so you know. Uh, I've been reading primarily from the Barnes & Noble's copy of On the Genealogy of Morals. I realize you guys are using the Marino Basic Writings of Existentialism. Um, for this lecture, when I give you quotes directly from the text, I think I'm actually going to use this one because I feel like the translation's a bit better. But I will give you the page number uh, that those quotes are on. And then when I give the quote, I'll make sure I give you a page number and a note on the Ed Puzzle stuff. Um, so what are we talking about today? You know, Nietzsche's second essay is basically an attempt to sift out uh, the, the, the origins of what he refers to as the bad conscience. Now, Nietzsche is typically pretty cynical towards this issue, but ultimately he's going to come to a conclusion that this might actually have a positive outcome, that uh, the bad conscience might effectively be able to be turned inward towards the, uh, <clears throat> let's say, artifice resentfulness of uh, the slave morality. So uh, I'm going to start off uh, a little out of order. I'm going to briefly talk about resentment or resentment, because it's kind of the underpinning theme in this entire essay. And, uh, you know, if you remember, resentment is kind of the, let's say, modal basis for the slave morality's being. They are the resentful man. So resentment or resentment is basically the uh, reassignment of, you know, experienced pain that, you know, accompanies one's own sufficiencies, and it's kind of redirected on to a scapegoat of sorts, or it's kind of a fall guy. For the slave morality, that's the aristocratic class. Uh, if you remember, we talked about the bird of prey or beast of prey uh, analogy, where uh, the lambs basically view the eagles as evil for doing basically what eagles do. So this is important because, you know, it, it doesn't take much for people to enter into resentment. As Nietzsche says, uh, you know, even the justice individual requires only a little dose of hostility to drain fairness from the brain. And I think we can all kind of I, I, I agree with that statement, uh, especially in contemporary times. So the discussion really starts off in kind of an odd way because he doesn't jump right into the question of conscience. He actually starts off with a, a statement about forgetfulness. Uh, specifically, forgetfulness in regards to the conscious individual. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in dealing with that person's ability to promise. And he calls forgetfulness, you know, a little quietude, a little tabula rasa, which is blank slate, uh, regarding our ability to promise. And it's that forgetfulness that allowed, let's say, um, more ancient man, uh, primordial man, to be happy. Now, Nietzsche follows that up with what I consider to be one of the best descriptors of all time. You know, he, he, he says that the person who cannot forget, the person who has, is incapable of forgetting, is uh, akin to being a dyspeptic. You know, what is dyspepsia? Well, you know, it's, it doesn't take much. You just got to look it up online. It's basically severe indigestion. Uh, you know, so this kind of manifestation of the the memory of the will, as Nietzsche calls it, you know, makes you feel physically ill. Again, I think that's kind of a profound statement, and I think it's something we all kind of know, you know? So, after that, Nietzsche starts digging into, let's say, preliminary work on the bad conscience, and he does that through a discussion of the sovereign individual. Uh, you know, the sovereign individual, you know, is... is the person who cares about things, who is worried about his promises, uh, you know, and, and this is the person that has conscience. Um, you know, and, and Nietzsche actually has a really profound quote on this issue, and this is on page 148 for you. And he says, The free man, the possessor of a protracted and unbreakable will, also possesses his measure of value. Looking out upon others from himself, he honors or he despises. And just as he is bound to honor his peers, the strong and the reliable, those with the right to make promises, he is bound to reserve a kick for the feeble windbags who promise without right to do so, and a rod for the liars who break their word. Wow, feeble windbags. That's, uh, those are pretty strong words. 
But what this is basically meant to say is that the conscionable person, the, 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 the sovereign individual, is the person who's capable of self-imposed accountability, uh, both for oneself and others. And this is a theme that runs throughout the existential landscape, excuse me, the existential landscape, this idea of responsibility. You know, the free individual is the responsible individual. So for Nietzsche, this is a, for all intents and purposes, a really new concept. Um, and, you know, that's debatable, but what, what, what he's basically calling it is kind of a ripe fruit. It's kind of the, the fruit of consciousness. And it's a late fruit at that. Um, prior to the development of the fruit of consciousness, consciousness, geez, I can talk today. Um, you know, Nietzsche said that the only way people learned were through a series of what he called painful mnemonics. Um, I don't know who all is, let's say broad who, who who all has a broad lexicon but a mnemonic is a teaching tool you know and in, in older times pain was the teaching tool and in fact pain still is very much a teaching tool uh, i think anybody who's ever failed a test that they didn't study for or had a relationship that ended for let's say other than amicable means can attest to that um and this actually ties right into Nietzsche's understanding of penal codes. Basically, penal codes and increasingly strict penal codes were used to kind of enforce, let's call it societal fiat or uh, societal norms. And we're going to talk about that again momentarily. So, um, so the whole notion of bad consciousness, he actually ties it into what he calls the consciousness of sin. And it's a direct result of the debtor-creditor relationship, or excuse me, the, 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 the creditor-ower or debtor debtee relationship, um, and basically the owing of something. And before we move on, I want you to take a second, <laughs> for those who are more atheistically inclined, kind of separate yourself from your criticism of terms like sin. I actually had to do this because... It's not tip just a religious word. It actually has basis in uh, archery and can be found in both Greek and Hebrew. And it basically means to miss the mark. So what Nietzsche is talking about here is being conscious that one is missing the mark. Anyway, to kind of go back to what we were talking about, the point is that when one commits a bad act or a bad deed, they effectively take on a debt to the person that they've uh, offended or acted out against, and that uh, it's almost a contractual issue. You do something wrong, you kind of owe the person something in return, and they typically, at least in older times, took that out through aggression and punishment and pain. Anybody who's familiar with uh, the Merchant of Venice uh, might understand the, the reference to owing someone a pound of flesh. And, uh, you know, that, that, that speaks to the power of inflicting suffering on the person who owes the debt you know and Nietzsche raises the question about why this actually counts and there's some argument to be made that there's pleasure uh, a kind of pleasure involved with inflicting pain on someone who owes you um and that, that actually comes back to the concept of suffering for Nietzsche you know prior to what Nietzsche will come to call the most evil age, which we'll talk about in a second, society, suffering in society was typically an external affair. You know, um, think about uh, the, the, the hunchback in Notre Dame. I know that's probably not the best example, but Quasimodo breaks the rules and he's made to suffer in public. It's a festival. People get enjoyment out of it. And that's a really weird thing, especially when you consider um, after the rise and let's say, um, inculcation of slave morality, we, we've, we, we've moved towards what Nietzsche refers to as a diseased refinement and moralization of humanity, you know, and this caused the animal man to learn to be ashamed of his instincts and our instincts are to punish for Nietzsche. Now that's on Marino 150. Okay. Now over the next couple of sections, and that's between eight to 10, Nietzsche basically lays out a historical analysis about how punishment 
criminality and justice, how they all evolve from the foundations of communal living. And this is going to be a recurring theme in SA2. Um, but I want to say something, and y'all probably haven't read Michel Foucault yet, but this is actually something that comes up again in Foucault's work. So if anybody's interested in kind of the history of punishment, um, the history of, let's say, kind of social power, and I'm, I'm critical of this myself, but there's something to be said here, then I would highly suggest um, actually looking up Foucault. He has a book called Discipline and Punish. Anyway, it isn't really until section 11 that Nietzsche starts delving into the bad conscience. Uh, and he, he directly links what he will call the bad conscience to the resentful man. So um, now... <sighs> What we need to talk about here for a second is how Nietzsche talks about the development of law, you know, because for Nietzsche, the development of law was the supreme powers uh, way of kind of, uh, as he calls it, combating the spirit of vindictiveness that was found in the subservient class. So those who are in the ultimate position of authority, probably with little concern to the less authoritative middle class, if you will, uh, created systems of law to kind of quell the animosity of the slave class. However, that doesn't mean that Nietzsche thinks laws like these are good. In fact, he, he says that such legalities can only be exceptional cases, which means, you know, we can only look at things on a, let's say, atomized individual level, that any legal organization conceived of as sovereign and universal would in fact be hostile to life. It would be a destroyer and dissolver of man. Uh, an outrage to future man, a symptom of fatigue and a secret cut to nothing, nothingness. Now that's on Marino 165 and 66. But this is precisely where Nietzsche alludes to the concept of nihilism. This cut to nothingness is a uh, discussion about, you know, that, that kind of willing to, it, it, when man cannot will any longer, he will will nothingness before not being able to will. That's what nihilism is. Um, so that finally brings us up to the question, what is the bad conscience? Now, when I talked about this in the introduction, I mentioned a turning inwards towards our animal instincts. And that's exactly what Nietzsche refers to as the bad conscience. It's the appropriation in every new development, by the way, will be appropriated by some other entity. Well, the sovereign individual lost control of the conscience. The resentful man took hold of the conscience and basically turned it into the bad conscience. And the bad conscience is turned in on our, let's say, animal selves. Um, and it's, it's a form of internal punishment as opposed to an external punishment, you know? Um, and again, this is one of those instances where Nietzsche says that it works. This internal punishment tames humanity. But the question is, does taming humanity make humanity better? And for Nietzsche, he says, absolutely not. It might make him, um, let's say, sharper, but it doesn't make him better. And that's, that's an important thing to consider. So let's kind of go back over that. So if we consider the person of conscience as being capable of self-imposed accountability, then the bad conscience which is related to what Nietzsche will call in essay three as the ascetic ideal, it makes that person feel guilty about their basic human animal instincts. And this is always coming from a place of internalization, you know? Now there's an upside to this. And the upside is that it presents humanity with what Nietzsche calls a profound problematic. And it's, that's the terrible, excuse me, that being that the terrible guilt of the bad conscience allows for the possibility that, and this is from Marino 175, man is no end, but only a stage, an interlude, a bridge, a great promise. Now, I'm going to put a little mark here, because that's a, that's a really important question. But, you know, what do you think Nietzsche's getting at here? Um, anybody who's read... <laughs> Thus spoke Zarathustra, which is going to be brought back up again by the end of this, uh, this, this essay, knows kind of what Nietzsche might be talking about. But for those of you who aren't familiar with his body of work, what, what could Nietzsche mean by uh, man being an interlude or a great promise? So 
moving into the tail end of SA2, and I've always kind of found the, t the, 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 the back half of the SA to be easy to confuse, be confused by, if only because it seems like he's offering a second or an expanded understanding of how the bad conscience uh, comes about. And that's what he's doing. Uh, basically, he's saying that the bad conscience, you know, he, he's citing the fitting of an unchecked population into a fixed form. Now, he uh, ex expands on that himself, but what he's basically saying is that you've got these, this culture of individuals. You've got a culture of what he calls um, beautiful blonde brutes in the first essay. And, you know, you're, you're trying to take these individuals and force them into a form, into what he calls a state. And he says that by forcing animal humanity, remember he refers to these people as beasts of prey, um, the primordial, the, or you have a primordial set of individuals, you know, by forcing them into a state, the instinct to freedom is suppressed. And it's precisely that instinct that gives the bad conscience something to focus on. Um, and that's interesting because as bad as that is in a certain way, in the way that it kind of does violence to the human spirit, it also gives rise to um, the expression of art, for example. And, you know, Nietzsche, <laughs> someone's going to be upset by this. Uh, someone might be upset by this having read it. Nietzsche actually calls this an illness in the same way that being pregnant is an illness. So let's kind of unpack that quick, okay? Why would he call pregnancy an illness? Well, for one, it's an illness like pregnancy in the sense that pregnancy is a condition that's kind of hallmarked by um, instances of varying degrees of pain, right? Um, you know, especially the, the act of giving birth. That is a transcendently painful uh, instance when, you know, someone doesn't, hasn't taken uh, been, been, been given drugs for it. Um, but what's interesting about that is that ultimate pain also carries with it this profound possibility, this, 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 this great um, instance of potential, you know? And it's a creative pain on top of that, you know? Um, anybody who's curious and interested in this topic of, you know, painful creation, you might look into the works of Mercia Iliada. Um, he calls this the creatrix. But anyway, that's going off topic. So it's interesting that Nietzsche does this, though, because he uses this whole discussion of pain to kind of go back into the discussion of uh, debt. But in this instance, now he's talking about the debt to, one an to one's ancestors. And this is important because, in, this is, I'm going to paraphrase Nietzsche, as cultures grow, as they become more powerful, and let's say greater, the need to kind of praise the past culture becomes more um, uh, profound. You know, and, and then the, the fear of not doing so, the fear of not paying one's debt to the ancestors grows. Nietzsche says that each step towards a race decay, all disastrous events, all systems of degeneration, of disintegration, always diminish the fear of the founder's spirit and whittle away the idea of his potent presence. And that's on Marino 179. And then at the zenith of this fear, the ancestor is effectively elevated to a status of godhood. In, you know, godhoods are these kind of disembodied, observing in the woods, to use a, a, a metaphor, um, observers of the bad conscience, you know? Um, now, Nietzsche goes on for a couple pages about gods. And I'm going to kind of truncate that whole lecture down really simple, in a really simply simple way here. You know, if we look at different cultures and the way they treat their gods, we can see good examples of this. So the Scandinavians and the Greeks, for instance, they, you know, they had little fear of their gods. And not ironically, they were relatively deprived of a priestly caste. And we know this simply by reading about them, by reading how they treated uh, their ceremonial acts. You know, the Poetic Edda for the Proto-Germanic tribes. The gods were almost looked at as 
on, on a very even plane as humans. And that's, that's weird, especially in contrast to the Abrahamic tree. For those who don't know, when I speak of the Abrahamic tree, I'm talking about um, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Those are all basically brother or sister relation, uh, uh, religions. Um, you know, that tradition is a God-fearing tradition from square one all the way through to whatever version of Revelation, uh, the, the Quran and the, 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 uh, the, the Bible, you know, they all have. It's a God-fearing uh, religion. And we see this is made prominent in the, you know, let's call, say <laughs> the preponderance of the priestly class there. So we can actually see this play out. Nietzsche talks about this on page 185. When he says that specifically the Greeks, they utilize their gods as buffers against the bad conscience so that they could continue to enjoy their, their, their freedom of soul. Interesting. So the gods were used as a way to kind of excuse the animal instincts. You know, if we talk about being possessed by the spirit of Zeus or possessed by the spirit of uh, uh, Mars or, you know, whichever, you know pantheon we're talking about that's what they're talking about they didn't have bad conscience about this uh christianity on the other hand and christian specifically elevated the concept of the suffering god to put focus on the bad consciences need in order to move forward as a people so it basically it promoted the moralization of the species so moving into the conclusion what, what is the conclusion for Nietzsche in regards to the bad conscience? Well, he, he ultimately declares the bad conscience is the extension of what he calls the immemorial tradition of vivisecting the conscience and practicing violence on ourselves and our animal nature. That's Marino 185, by the way. But he doesn't stop there. He also envisions a future where people won't view those na that nature uh, with what he calls an evil eye, you know, and uh, in fact, we'll be able to take the bad conscience and redirect it, um, you know, towards the life denying ideals that were kind of present during his time and even during part of our time. Now, I want you to really think about that. How ha has this happened? You know, is this happening? I think there's a strong argument to be made that even within the past 70 years, there's been a movement uh, back toward the pre-Christian um, era of, you know, even, let's say, the world to a greater extent. There's been a rise in uh, neo-pagan religion, religions. Uh, I know <laughs> Scandinavian religions are popular right now, Wicca, all these things. So we're basically moving back towards something that already was. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily the most proper thing to be doing, but it says something about the uh, change in ideals. So my question for you is, are we finally finding a way to turn that evil eye in on the uh, resentfully based bad conscience? Now, Nietzsche kind of gives us a clue as to what's going to kind of precede that. And basically he says that for an order this for, excuse me, in order for this to occur, that, you know, we're going to need what he calls spirits of a different caliber. Um, you know, what he means by this, perhaps, is individuals who were made strong by great ordeals. You know, in his per personal example of this, as I've noted, is his Zarathustra from uh, the Spoke Zarathustra. It's no small coincidence that both in that book and in this book, he refers to Zarathustra as Zarathustra the godless, you know? So, anyway, bad conscience. Let's kind of sum that up again. It's basically the manifestation <laughs> of the ascetic ideals, right? Of this kind of um, you know, conscience turned inward on ourselves and our nature. That's what the bad conscience is, so... Okay, that's it for today. I might upload something uh, via our own little uploader service uh, where I talk. I, I'd like to talk about SA3, but I'll do that in much shorter order. Um, so until then, I hope you all got something out of this, and I'll see you soon.